Hello, let's talk about disease of the cervix. We start with cervicitis, itis meaning inflammation. And so you know that this is just an immune reaction to a pathogen, most commonly bacterial, although it can be viral, and of the bacteria that can cause cervicitis, chlamydia, which is an atypical intracellular species, and Neisseria gonorrhea, that's a gram-negative diplococcus, account for roughly 40% of all cases. So when we're speaking to the cervix, we can observe it using colposcopy. That's what it's called when we take a look at the cervix. And we can even sample cervical tissue or perform a pap smear, uh, a swab with a elongated uh, Q-tip, you know, and just kind of take a little sample. In this image here, uh, in the right upper quadrant, this is showing you what a normal cervix looks like. It's just uh, kind of like any other normal mucosal tissue. And as you can tell in this particular photo, uh, this is demonstrating the degrees of various precancerous changes into uh, full-blown cancer of the cervix in the upper left. But as you can imagine, in a cervicitis, there would be a pustular appearance to this tissue. Uh, and it would just clearly have some liquefactive necrosis, a lot of neutrophil action going on there. Also important to understand the cervix is these two terms, endocervix and ectocervix, and that's referring to what side of the transitional line of the histology that we're on. And so when we say transitional line, when I say that, I mean that you've got kind of farther inside the body, columnar epithelium that just mutains, maintains the mucosal hydration of this tissue. And then as you get closer to the outside of the body, just like the GI tract, you transition into a stratified squamous epithelium that's more readily able to handle abrasion and the forces of the outside world. So there's a squamocolumnar junction, just like you see in the GI tract, at the location where this happens, and that is the line that separates the endocervix from the ectocervix. Now, this is of clinical importance because of this phenomenon called ectropion, in which there is some metaplastic change in that you'll start to see, you'll see a red area, kind of like you, you get a scrape on your knee, but it doesn't break the skin. So what do you call that? A strawberry, right? Well, this is kind of like a strawberry, the cervix, and it's due to a couple possible factors. One of the, one of the possible inciting factors being just an inflammation in the early stages of an infection, but another, another factor being uh, high levels of estrogen in the body because estrogen is going to dilate the cervical loss. And I wish I could speak more to why that happens. I don't really know why. Uh, all I know is that that's the how. So estrogen mediates that. And so during puberty, when you have a high level of circulating estrogen, this phenomenon called ectropion is actually normal. It's physiologic, not necessarily pathologic. However, after puberty, when estrogen kind of falls back into a trough a little bit and then stays steady and plateaus, then this phenomenon of ectropion should go away. And so ectropion, again, means this red area that we're looking at there in the center of the cervix. What does that represent histologically? That represents columnar epithelial cells. And so that columnar epithelium should be on the inside, not the outside of the cervix. In other words, it should be on the endocervix, not on the ectocervix. So if you see columnar cells on the ectocervix, you know that there is dilation of the cervical loss going on. And so again, if that's during puberty, if that's during a situation where there's a lot of estrogens going around, that's normal. But if it's not in a patient who has a lot of estrogens, if it's in a 35 or a 40 year old woman, then you can really suspect some sort of pathology going on here to generate the inflammation necessary to kind of flip the endocervix outside like that. And so if ectropion uh, continues and is uncorrected, it can lead to squamous metaplasia because the columnar cells, here's a better look at those columnar cells, you know, of the endocervix, well, if they're flipped out, as in ectropion, then eventually they're going to get abrased, you know, and they're going to get exposed to a different environment. The vaginal environment has a way lower pH than the uh, intrauterine environment. And so these 
columnar cells are going to get damaged to the point where they're going to want to transform into squamous cells just to protect themselves so that they don't die off. And so that process of change is called metaplasia, when one cell type changes to another. And we've seen exactly this columnar to squamous metaplasia before in the early bronchi, the primary bronchi of smokers, because cigarette smoke is doing the same thing. It's just kind of abrading the surface of a columnar epithelia to the point where it's damaging enough it's damaging that columnar epithelium enough to want to get it to get it to want to change to squamous. There we go. So obviously, if that continues long enough, the source of inflammation it can turn into a dysplasia, which is going to be metaplasia plus nuclear changes. So that's a clinical finding of cervicitis, that ectropion, and. Uh, other than that, cervicitis can be acute or chronic, you know, and so that's easy. Are there neutrophils or lymphocytes whenever you take a biopsy or swab? And there are two symptoms that are telling for cervicitis and would uh, possibly necessitate a farther look on colposcopy. Those two symptoms are discharge and postcoital bleeding. So, the reason we bring up ectropion is to say that that's kind of a criteria for making the diagnosis of cervicitis officially. If you see that ectropion, that word, what does that mean? That means that you've got columnar endocervical cells flipped outside the endocervix onto the ectocervix in the vaginal cavity. And they're undergoing, they're going to undergo some metaplastic change into squamous cells. Also, a diagnostic criteria, you can think cervicitis if you see a friable cervix. That means that you've got it open, right? You're looking at it, you take your swab to collect a sample, you poke it, and it just bleeds all over the place. That's friable. A friable tissue has a loose consistency. Um, visually observing discharge from the cervix is going to make you say, yeah, that's cervicitis. And then any combination of those signs. So what's important here? The microbiology involved, again, chlamydia and gonorrhea are the most common causes. But you've also got candidiasis and trichomonas, that's a parasite. Stepped on a wasp. Oh, yeah, I've been having wasps in my house, yo, like seven over the past 10 days. I got to figure out where this, this nest is. There's a, there's a couple places I'm suspecting. I got this fireplace that's not a fireplace. It's a pseudo fireplace. It's kind of got a cover on it. But we have a, uh, a, a chimney, and so I'm thinking maybe they're in the chimney. But then also there's this place where I had a hole in my ceiling for like seven day stretch or so and so i'm wondering if one of those buggers got up in there whenever i had the hole in my ceiling i'm looking around to see if i see any more i can't do wasps yo like like spiders okay sure like fine we got spiders you know like roaches even it's like i'll smack one if i see one but i'm not gonna get angry at it it's just cockroach but like a wasp like yo get out of here man get out of here so anyways looking at the microbiology uh Got a few helpful, possibly helpful slides pulled up. Here's chlamydia. Remember that you've got elementary bodies and reticular bodies. And uh, I can't exactly remember which one's intracellular, which one's extracellular. So I won't make a judgment call there. I'm sure you can remember. But here is one of the uh, intracellular inclusion bodies that you see when chlamydia is dividing inside a cell. These kind of hollowed out spherules are what they look like. And then uh, here we've also got these very small, clearly not human cells, these things that are uh, very, very tiny. These are the extracellular form of chlamydia. So remember that this is a facultative intracellular bug. That means it doesn't have to be intracellular, but it will replicate intracellularly. And what else about it? Well, you can see it with a game sustain. Uh, which is going to stand for nucleic acids. And so that's why it'll stain anything inside a cell. 
uh, and you usually can't see it on gram stain. So if they say gram stain came back negative and you're suspecting chlamydia is in your differential, well, then that really elevates it high up on the list. So what's our treatment for this doxycycline, right? And so what do we also give alongside it? What's the drug? Ceftriaxone. For what bug? Why are we giving ceftriaxone? Gonorrhea. Neisseria gonorrhea, which is gram-negative diplococcus, and so because it's just gram-negative coccus, a cephalosporin is going to be very efficacious against it. So, uh, yeah, if uh, – last thing I'll say about chlamydia, you know, it starts at the outside and kind of works its way up the vagina into the cervix, but it doesn't necessarily have to stop there. And if the patient waits a long time before going to the doctor, the chlamydial infection, really chlamydia particularly, loves to just keep going up the uterus, up the fallopian tubes, uh, and it'll get into the entire, through the entire reproductive system. And that's called pelvic inflammatory disease, big source of pelvic pain. And it can get so bad to where it even uh, kind of, uh, melts through that tissue and gets into the peritoneal cavity. And so that's a really bad, probably the worst outcome of PID. Taking a look here at trichomonas vaginalis. I see another wasp in there. No, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to kill this dude. So uh, wasps release a pheromone. Whenever you crush a wasp, it gives off a lot of pheromones that attract other wasps. Okay, so uh, I've killed two of these dudes now. So hopefully I can just get the whole family in here, you know? Like I got my raid. It's like, yeah, go ahead, fly at me. I'll just spray straight in the face, right? I used to be totally scared of bugs, you know? Like when I was a kid, I used to be like, ah, bug! You know, it's like some of you are probably still like that. But uh, the trick to getting rid of household pests is to get really PO, get really angry at them because anger is a circuit in your brain that can override the fear circuit. So just get really angry, be like, you wasp, why are you in my house? You know, like get really mad at it and that'll help. So here's trichomonas. It's a parasite and it's got a characteristic, uh, what is it? I think this is one, yeah, this has got the green yellow discharge. So. Trichomonas, the parasite, has a green-yellow discharge. Something like Gardnerella, right, is going to have a clear discharge with a fishy odor. Candidiasis is going to give you a thick, white, curd-like discharge. And so the, just the visual diagnosis of these different infections is going to take you a long way. So uh, the bodies of these trichomonas parasites, really small, and if they're fully evolved, you know, then they're going to have a little flagellated tell, tail. They'll have a flagellum on them. And so that's what you're seeing there. And then um, here's Canada albicans. You can see the hyphae. I'll kind of trace some here. Very long and uh, sticky looking, stick-like. Um, so you see Canada, you won't miss it. So that is cervicitis. Now we got a small section on endocervical polyps, benign pedunculated growths of the endocervix present in two to five percent of adult women. They're the most common cervical growth in multigravids. Multigravid means that you have had more than one pregnancy in your lifetime. So it's an overgrowth of stromal tissue, not of squamous tissue and not of glandular uh, adenomatous tissue, you know. Um, columnar cells. It's just an overgrowth of connective tissue, stroma. So endocervical polyps are covered by columnar endocervix or metaplastic squamous epithelium. Remember we said that when the columnar endocervix gets flipped out onto the ectocervix because of dilation of the cervical os, which is normal if it's due to estrogen, but pathologic if it's due to infection and inflammation. Well, then if that columnar epithelium stays flipped on the outside, it eventually transforms into squamous cells, and that's called metaplasia. So these polyps are typically asymptomatic, and you can take them out if you want. They're probably, it's probably recommended that you take them out, but uh, unlike endometrial polyps, you know, 
the polyp is not the precancerous lesion for cervical cancer. So it's not like this thing is going to just transform into a cancer later on down the line. You know, it's just, it could get bigger and bigger, but it's not going to itself become a primary cancer. Now, speaking of cancers of the uterine cervix, right before we get into there, a couple pictures of squamous metaplasia. Notice uh, I'm tracing along with green where you've got a columnar epithelium, but then I'll go to yellow. Somewhere over here, the columnar epithelium turns squamous right on the outside. And these are big, funky squamous cells too. They're not flat and nicely arranged in sheets. And then this population over here is starting to get some really big nuclei on them. So you might call that dysplasia over uh, where I just put the X. And here's one more example. Uh, we've got tracing along with green, a bunch of columnar cells forming an endocervical epithelium here. And then you can also tell that there's columnar epithelium on the left here too, and then kind of in the middle. But then somewhere in the very middle of this section, I'll go blue, we turn into a bunch of squamous cells on our epithelium. And so that is a metaplastic change because all around it is columnar epithelium, but right here in the middle is squamous. Finally, if you just keep going with metaplasia, you get to dysplasia. You keep driving through metaplasia. You're going to reach dysplasia. So what's dysplasia? Well, it's metaplasia plus nuclear changes. The nuclei of these dysplastic cells is going to appear, the, the nuclei will appear large and dark because cytoplasm is going to condense around these nuclei. So they're gonna look relatively larger. They're gonna stain a little bit darker. Right here on the right side of this image, we've got some squamous dysplasia as compared to just metaplasia on the left side. So some basics of cervical cancers. About three out of every four will be a squamous carcinoma. And one out of four, the other one out of four is going to be a glandular adenocarcinoma. And you see a few sarcomas, which are going to be connective tissue, malignant tumors, and then some lymphomas, which are our B cell tumors, but mostly it's squamous and adeno. Now, in developing countries, this is the second most common female cancer. But in developed countries, America being one, cervical cancer is pretty uncommon. And well, I won't pin that on any one risk factor. Instead, let's go through them one at a time. So sexual intercourse, if you don't have sex, you won't get cervical cancer. That's it. Age at first intercourse. This is second in importance. So if frequency of sexual intercourse is not an option, then the answer is probably age at first intercourse. That's the answer they're looking for in terms of most important risk factor. Now, if age at first intercourse is not an option, you're going to go with number of sexual partners. That is another very important risk factor for the development of cervical cancer. Now, something that is both a risk factor and possibly a causative agent, human papillomavirus. In initial studies of cervical cancer, human papillomavirus DNA was found in about 60% of cases, but the most recent meta-analysis are finding rates exceeding 95%. So it's really rare that we find cancers so strongly correlated with the presence of a specific pathogen. And so uh, another really strong one that's almost a one-to-one -one causative relationship that comes to mind is going to be helicobacter pylori and gastric cancer. 
or maybe something like Epstein-Barr virus and a couple of lymphomas. But they're few and far between, and they're definitely uh, not, not all pathogens are causative for cancer, so this one sticks out. And then this STL goes into a long, long spree uh, rampaging about human papillomavirus, talking a whole lot about it. So the rundown, double-stranded, non-enveloped DNA virus. It's a naked virus. It's double-stranded. It's got a circular genome. It's got a subunit vaccine. I think it's got a circular circular genome. Um, I'll put it. I'll put something in the comment section if it doesn't. Um, and what does it have tropism for? Specifically, the stratum basale, so your basal cell layer of the epidermis or the epithelium in this case. So the the basal cell layer. What's special about basal cells? Well, they divide and. Most, any cell on top of the basal cell that's not attached to the basement, basement membrane really doesn't divide. It's gone uh, quiescent. It's in G0. It'll be in G0 until it gets sloughed off because that's the fate of all epithelial cells. But these stratum basale cells are labeled, you know, they are constantly undergoing the cell cycle to pop out another copy of themselves. And so that's what replenishes either the cutaneous or the mucosal epithelium, because we know epithelial tissue lines both the skin and mucosal cavities. So because HPV gets into the stratum basale, it's really tough to get it out of there, really, really tough to get it out of there, because it's in these cells that are constantly renewing themselves, which is why vaccination is really important uh, for the future of the spread of HPV, but that's another talk for another time. So. HPV gets inside these keratinocytes of the stratum basale, and it doesn't kill them. It doesn't bust open the cell. It just kind of gets shed off as a cargo within epithelial squamae. That's a great half sentence there. You know, you can, you can picture these epithelial cells as smugglers, you know, and HPV is the cargo. So smuggling what? I don't know. I'll leave that to your imagination. A lot of things you can smuggle. So the E5 protein is not really something that you get bored questions on, but the E5 protein coded by human papillomavirus upregulates EGFR and makes infected cells kind of more responsive to growth signals so they can get through that G1 phase quicker, which is good for the virus at the end of the day. Some manifestations of human papillomavirus uh, at the gross level include basic warts. And if you get warts on your genitalia, we're going to call that condyloma acuminata. Now you might also see a flat condyloma on the cervix. So I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to connect the dots here. Um, if you see a big bump on the cervix, don't rule out endocervical polyp, which again is totally benign and doesn't really necessarily have to be taken out. And human papillomavirus, which loves to cause bumps all over other parts of the body, can actually leave a flat lesion on the cervix. So it's kind of paradoxical there. But this is what it looks like. This is called flat condyloma. And so you're going to stain the cervix, not stain really. You're going to douse it in some fluid. You're going to splash, drip, drip, splash on it, you know. And you're going to look to see if the cervix turns white whenever you put this given fluid on it. And if it does, you're going to call it aceto white because you're basically putting acetic acid on it. And so if it does turn aceto white, that lets you know that there's an infection there. So that's the flat condyloma. Again, it doesn't have, it's not always going to look like this. It's not always going to be a big bump on the cervix. That's HPV on the skin cutaneously. But if it's on a mucous membrane, it might be flat. And then uh, histologically, the hallmark of HPV infection is the coilocyte, which is distinguished by perinuclear halos. And we zoom in on this cell right here. You can really see what they're talking about. You know, it's like, 
It's the, the compartment is clearly demarcated from the rest of the cytoplasm. Here's another cell lower left there that's got a halo around it. And so normal cells, here's a normal cell, obviously don't have that perinuclear halo. Here's another one right next to it that has no such halo. So if you see a cell with a halo in a Papanikolaou smear, such as in the top right here, that's a halo. Bottom left down here, go green. That's a halo right there, you know? So what this means is you have an HPV infection on your hands. So why do you get this halo? Well, HPV is going to make proteins that destabilize the cytoskeleton of these epithelial cells. And outside the cell, that makes them more prone to kind of slough off and thus spread the virus. But inside the cell, that means a loss of intermediate filaments. So understand the intermediate filament is analogous to the frame of your house. You've got appliances and countertops and cabinets and walls, you know, but they're kind of just accessory because the house wouldn't be there if it weren't for its frame. So that's analogous to, you know, the ribosomes and the Golgi and the et cetera inside the cell that really wouldn't be there if it weren't for the intermediate filaments such as keratin and actin, you know, and desmin holding these cells up on the inside. It's their cytoskeleton. So if you lose cytoskeletal elements, especially in your nucleus and your nucleolus, well, then that thing is just going to balloon up, you know, like a tent without tent poles. That is the perinuclear halo. Here's an aside. Uh, the SDL talks about E6 and E7. So there are these uh, carcinogenic proteins encoded by human papillomavirus. And one of them is going to impair P53. The other one is going to impair RB, retinoblastoma tumor suppressor gene. So the way that I remember this is from the sketchy video on HPV. We have got a straw shaped like the number seven and it's in a glass of root beer. So that means that the E7 protein is the one that corresponds to retinoblastoma RB root beer. And then you can obviously remember that E6 is going to be the one that takes a bite out of P53. So just remember one and you remember both. A big seven-shaped straw and a glass of root beer, E7RB. Uh, so I think we covered everything that's in that section of the SDL. Here's the E6, E7 stuff. You read that if you want. Um, concluding points on HPV. 31, 33, 35 are most prevalent in African-American women. So there's a little bit of a gender. Uh, diff or a racial difference there. 16 and 18, those are the traditional high risk ones. Those are the most common genotypes in white women. And uh, the difference between low risk and high risk types is that low risk human papillomaviruses are maintained as extrasomal, extra chromosomal DNA. That, so that doesn't mean nothing. What's important is that high risk human papillomavirus gets integrated into the host genome. So even if you use really good antivirals, it's kind of too late, you know. HPV is so common that most sexually active women will get at least one type of HPV at some point in their lives. 90% of infections clear within two years. That's good news. And yeah, that's HPV. So we mentioned before, about three of every four cervical carcinomas, that means invasive cancer, is going to be squamous cell. And then one in four is going to be an adenocarcinoma or a glandular cancer. And so there's a different precursor lesion for the squamous cancer than there is for the glandular cancer. And that should make a lot of sense because they're two different origin tissues. Cervical neoplasia is thought to arise within the transformation zone which is essentially the area between the original and the current squamocolumnar junction. 
So why would you have a difference between your original and your current squamocolumnar junction? And the answer to that is squamous metaplasia of columnar cells. So again, let's, let's recap this. Something's going to happen to kind of flip, dilate the cervical os and expose some columnar cells. And that's called ectropion. When you find columnar cells on the outside of the cervix, the ectocervix, and because of the acidic environment of the vagina, those cervical cells are going to take some damage and they're going to respond by transforming to squamous cells. And so you are no longer looking at, after that happens, you're no longer looking at the original squamocolumnar junction. What you see as the new squamocolumnar junction is going to be a little bit upstream or proximal from where it used to be. So between those two points is your transformation zone. And that's where cervical cancer pops up out of because of the metaplasia, which really quickly leads to dysplasia, which leads to carcinoma in situ, which leads to cancer. Here is the section of the SDL saying that during adolescence, ectropion is normal. It's a physiologic process. And so after adolescence, after puberty, after estrogen levels go down, eversion or ectropion should reverse. It, is, it does reverse in most women. So that means that after puberty, if you see this, this right here, if you see this after puberty, it's pathologic like 90, 95% of the time, almost all the time. So that's what, it, that's what the precancerous lesion looks like visually. Again, that red area around the cervical os. And then if you look at it histologically, then you can identify whether it's a squamous or a glandular precancerous lesion, and that's a distinction of quality. And then to further subdivide the squamous precancerous lesions, we make uh, differentiations of quantity based on the thickness of the epithelium that's taken up by the carcinoma in situ or the dysplasia. So that was an unnecessarily long sentence. <laughs> um, so we've got one, two, and three carcinoma. We've got a, what's it called? Cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grades one, two, and three, right? And then that's for squamous cancers. If we find a preglandular cancer, we're just going to call it CGIN, cervical glandular intraepithelial neoplasia. So that's where we're going. And we're going to call this precancerous lesion a one or a two or a three based on the thickness of epithelium it occupies. There we go. That's a much more abbreviated version of that sentence. So if it's taken up roughly one third of the epithelium, we're going to call it intraepithelial neoplasia one. If it's taken up two thirds or so of the epithelium, we are going to call it cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grade two. And then if it's taking up the entire breadth of the epithelium, we are going to call that CIN3. It's that easy. So just looking at this here, photo on the left, do we got a CIN1, 2, or 3? Well, it can't be 3 because 3 is the whole thing. It's not going to be 2 because 2 is 2 thirds. And so that's looking like 1 thirds thickness of the epithelium to me. So that's a CIN1. And then it might give you a smear, a cytologic smear that's going to ask you to make the judgment call without seeing the thickness of the epithelium. So you might be like, oh, well, what do I do in that situation? And the answer is you look at the nuclei of these cells because here's a grade two. Obviously, if you're looking at the image on the left here, then your dysplastic cells are taking up most of the epithelium, but you've still got some pretty normal cells on top here. So it's not the whole thing. So you can't call that a three. And then you take the swab and you say, well, these are really big nuclei here, you know, but I don't see any mitotic figures. 
I don't see any like pyknosis. I don't see any karyorexis. I don't see any really abnormal nuclear changes. So you're kind of just left with two in the middle. And then a three on the left, the whole thickness of this epithelium is dysplastic. That's a CIN3. And then on the right, man, you can't even tell what's in the middle here. That's, that's definitely, that's a very far way away from a CIN1. So again, kind of a judgment call, but really you got a good gut feeling for it because you've been looking at these cells for a minute, yo. Here's the acetyl white epithelium. And that's a colposcopic finding. And what this is telling you is there is some degree of precancerous change going on in this epithelium. Then you can have different patterns of capillary uh, regrowth into this damaged tissue because you know cells get injured, then they pop off cytokines. And uh, one of those cytokines is vascular endothelial growth factor, which is going to encourage vascularization. So blood vessels grow into damaged tissue. That's all this is saying. I don't really understand why it's in the SDL other than as a kind of a curiosity because it's like, okay, mosaic. Yeah, you know, we're like, oh, punctate. Yeah, for sure. That's what that is. But there doesn't seem to be any real clinical implication for that. So... There are no clinical symptoms that are indicative of the presence of precancerous cervical neoplasia. What that means is that we catch this on incidental screening for other conditions. Good prognosis. Pretty good, I think. Half of them regress. That's great news, you know. Where else in the body are you going to find that half of the cancers of a given tissue just turn back into nothing? Less than 2% of these CINs, uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasias, less than 2% of them will turn malignant, and that's cancer. So monitor, 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 because it's about 10 years from start to finish. Now, glandular precancerous lesions have a chance to turn into an adenocarcinoma, which is an invasive glandular tumor. But before they get to that stage, they're just a cervical glandular intraepithelial neoplasia because they're a benign tumor. So SDL gives you a clue as to how it would you would get asked about glandular cancers on a test as compared to squamous cancers. You might get told that the growth is observed superior to the squamocolumnar junction. And you might get told the growth is in the endocervix and is tough to visualize on colposcopy. And those sort of findings would clue you into maybe this is a glandular cell of origin, not a squamous cell. Histology, what does it look like? Um, it's going to be pretty messed up with enlarged, elongated nuclei. Cigar-shaped nuclei, that's important. We'll take a look at that in just a second. With hyperchromasia, that just means deeply pigmented. And epithelium showing a loss of polarity. So this is something you might see in tubular kidney damage, for example, um, where you've got an apical and a basal side. And so normally nuclei are on the basal lateral side of a given lumen, you know, but loss of polarity means that uh, nuclei are just going to be floating every which way. They're not really going to care what side of the cell that they're on because they're losing uh, all sorts of this and that's due to the changes going on within them. Um, risk factors for glandular cancer of the cervix, 16 and 18, same thing there. So that's a lot of words that we just went through. Let's look at some pictures. This is really all you got to know about the squamous cancers of the cervix. Because if it's glandular and you get a picture of a glandular cancer, it's going to stick out like a sore thumb because it's going to have a lumen. It's literally a gland. So if it's just on the outside, it's squamous. And again, we're going to call it a one or a two or a three based on the depth with which this growth uh, occupies the epithelium. If it's the whole thickness, it's a three. If it's one third of it, it's a one. There we go. Now, 
glandular intraepithelial neoplasias. We're going to call it a low grade or a high grade, and you're not going to get asked about that, but I've got one picture of each. Uh, so here's what we're talking about with kind of the loss of polarity. See how it kind of looks like a pseudostratified epithelium in that some of these cells have nuclei that are on the basolateral side of things, and some of these cells are on the apical side of things like that. And then um, hyperchromasia is prominent. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, this is a really good photo because here on the left side of this photo, we're looking at a normal, really normal gland. But then in the lower right, blue, we've got a totally dysplastic gland. Uh, so green right there, normal gland, blue, cancer. And something really similar here, green, way more normal looking gland over here on the left. And then on the right here, blue, that's cancer. So notice the darkening of those nuclei, the elongation of those nuclei, they're cigar shaped. You can spot that from a mile away. Finally, talking about the microinvasive carcinoma. Has a particular histology that's going to penetrate the basement membrane, and that's really what sets it apart from those uh, CINs, you know, CINs, they're benign, they're not invasive. Uh, so those microinvasive ones, they're gonna bust through the basement membrane again and there's gonna be a lot of lymphocytes down in there. And so these are not gonna have uh, a ton of characteristic elements or what I was really trying to say there is if it's a squamous cancer, you're gonna see keratin pearls and squamous nests, period. You know, and if it's an adenocarcinoma, then uh, you're going to see glands penetrating down into the submucosa, period, you know, into the connective stroma. And if it is a microinvasive carcinoma, uh, me personally, I'm going to process of elimination it. I'm going to say, well, that's not squamous, that's not glandular, has to be microinvasive. And as always, HPV type 16 and 18 are the major risk factors for the development of these cancers. So that's cervical disease.